Hello there, everyone. Uh, nice to be with you tonight. I'm Geraldine Doog, and uh, welcome to this special event here at uh, GOMA, special uh, in conjunction with Saturday Extra, which is why I'm here. Uh, for the GOMA Talks program. We were here last year and enjoyed it so much we sort of invited ourselves back. And happily this year it's right on our patch because to coincide with the seventh uh, Australia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art Exhibition, the people here have invited us to have a good yarn about, uh, with some special guests today, on this subject of Australia and Asia and culture, all given extra prominence, no doubt you've uh, noticed this week with the um, uh, Julia Gillard, the Prime Minister, appointing a special panel to take things further and to build on the uh, Ken Henry White Paper last year. And of course, it just seems to us as we were thinking about it that it, there's only so much that governments can do, though there are things that governments have to do, it, it would seem, but uh, it's very much the business of collaborating on a personal level um, on the personal and collective level, this business of cultural collaboration, and it doesn't just happen overnight. So that's what we're going to try to tease out with our fabulous guests this evening on uh, what is a marvellous panel. Dr Julianne Schultz, Dr Michael Wesley, Linda Javen and Wesley Enoch, and I'd like you to welcome them heartily. Now, I'll introduce them as we go a bit more uh, fully, but I've suggested to them a working title for this evening, which is Asia and Australia, Is Creative Mateship Possible? The Truth, Please. Now, what I'm trying to discern there is that I'd like to hear their dreams and hopes, because I think in many ways they're on the front line of trying to make this new century happen, but what's been their experience, too, in trying to follow up on their dream? So if there are gulfs between uh, us here in Australia and the region in terms of culture, let's name some of that. Let's not be super polite and dodge some of these difficult issues. So I'm hoping that tonight that we do actually get to tease out some of the possibilities and some of the challenges, this is the classic um, Radio National Code <laughs> that we use, in this business of Australia and Asia and uh, the, the next stage for us all. So I'm going to ask each of them to speak for, say, two to three minutes, answering that question about whether creative mateship is possible, the truth, please. Then I'll open it up to questions from the floor. So I'm going to ask Michael Wesley to... to uh, kick us off tonight, and Michael Wesley is Professor of National Security at the ANU, previously Director of the Lowy Institute, with various appointments at universities here and in Asia. His book, There Goes the Neighbourhood, Australia and the Rise of Asia, came out two years ago now, and I think was extremely influential, actually, in preparing Australia for the sense that there was something new coming. And his essay, Trans Century, features in the exhibition catalogue for the 7th Asia-Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art. So, um, uh, Michael, your three minutes starts now. Oh, thanks, Geraldine. Lovely to be here. I feel a bit like Madonna with this... Um this uh, <laughs> microphone arrangement going on. So excuse me if I burst into song. Um, I really liked the, um, the, the, the idea of creative mateship, Geraldine, because it really got me thinking about what mateship actually is. Um, and to me, mateship is really a set of expectations, a set of mutual expectations between yourself and someone else. Um, it's, it's an expectation uh, that you can rely on someone else and that they can rely on you. It's, a, it's, a, it's an expectation of your own behaviour and it's an expectation of their behaviour as well. And I've got to say that um, thinking about it in those terms, I don't think Australia has that sort of relationship with the countries to our north. Um, in fact, as I was um, thinking about metaphors, it was, I think Australia and the countries to our north um, are, are a little bit like neighbours who don't really get on. Um, they're very proper towards each other. Uh, they uh, act very properly towards each other. They mow their lawns. They keep uh, their picket fences nice and white. They possibly say good morning to each other. Um, but it's, uh, it, they're not the sort of people that you'd invite over um, for a beer and a barbecue and, uh, and share your dreams about, about life. And I think... 
One of the main problems that has um, really held us back from having a more genuine sort of mate-like relationship with our northern neighbours <clears throat> is the fact uh, that we are so different in terms of our levels of prosperity mm. and our success. You know, Australia, uh, following European um, settlement here, uh, came from uh, the, the cultures in the world that were the richest, that were the most dynamic, that were the most prosperous, that were the most powerful. And we looked over the fence and we saw um, uh, people that weren't as good as us, that we thought weren't as good as us. But I think the good news is that that is starting to change. Um, that gulf in uh, success and prosperity uh, has really started, that, that has held us back from making that sort of emotional mateship commitment has started to uh, fade away. Uh, and now I think this century we'll see uh, the, the countries to our north be the centres of dynamism and wealth and cultural production. Uh, and, uh, and that will make it much easier for us to start to look at them uh, as people that we want to have over for that proverbial barbecue. Problem is, I'm not sure that they'll be looking at us in, in, in a similar way um, as uh, the remnant of that, that little kind of corner of the world called Europe that isn't doing so well at the moment. Will they want to come, Will to they want to come and have the barbecue? <laughs> that's the big question for us and I think that's the big challenge for us. OK, Michael, thank you. Now, Linda Javen is uh, a bit of a polymath on matters Asian. She's a sinologist and she translates Chinese work. She's written both fiction and non-fiction. She's a visiting fellow at the Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies at the ANU. And she, like uh, Julianne, has written a libretto. This one is called Passion. It's a bilingual libretto in English and Chinese. It's what you do <laughs> when you're a sinologist for the Chinese National Peking Opera Company, though Contained in this tale is quite a, it's quite a cautionary tale, isn't it, Linda? Yes, it is. It's, uh, well, it, it's actually a very interesting tale because it has caution and hope. Um, just a little bit of background. I've been going back and forth to China for about 30 years and I've developed a lot of very long-standing friendships um, uh, in China and I've also had a number of creative collaborations in different areas, uh, translating poetry with Chinese poets into Chinese, um, doing that kind of thing. I've been doing a lot of work with film where it's not just subtitle translation but they like me to sit in the edit suite, some of the directors, and and talk to them about, oh, do you think this should be cut? Do you think this is too long, etc. We, we, we really I get involved. It's very, it's wonderful when you're actually respected, um, not by everybody, but by, by the odd person. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely thing. This thing with passion is the, is the cautionary tale. It starts out actually, funnily enough, in Queensland because um, the Asia Pacific Screen Awards, uh, which I was attending a couple of years ago, a number of years ago, there was a guy, I wasn't really, he was from China, I wasn't supposed to be in charge of translating for him or anything, but I, he got into some trouble with a Sydney hotel and I had to straighten it out. I completely forgot who this person was. Um, years later, I'm sitting in a, in a Peking opera theater and this guy looks at me, sitting next to me, and he says, I love Peking Opera, he says, he says, Jia Pei Lin, that's my Chinese name. And I said, yes. And it turned out it was that fellow. And he says, oh my God, she saved my life. He's telling all these people. She did the most amazing thing. I was like, I'm trying to remember who he is. Um, Anyway, he, long story, but he then says to me, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm actually trying to write a story, a, a, a libretto about the old Chinese story, Pan Jin Lian, a Ming dynasty story about a very bad woman. I was giving it a feminist take. Um, and he said, oh, you should talk to the president of the National Peking Opera Company. I said, really? I don't, I don't think so. Anyway, I did. Um, he loved the idea. He turns out to be this really innovative thinker. Um, put me up, uh, put me together with a wonderful composer, the chief, one of the most eminent Peking opera composers in China. We go full steam ahead, and then the whole thing is a very long story, but came, the short version is it came down on these shoals. One shoal was the internal politics of the Peking 
opera. We had the support of DFAT, we didn't get corporate support, although we tried a lot in China and in, in Australia. Um, we had full DFAT support, we had lots of goodwill going into this thing. Um, but in the Chinese Peking opera world, there's people who want to innovate and work with foreigners and there are people who don't. And that was one problem. Another problem was some of my co-collaborators in Australia um, would do things like they'd say, well, we do this uh, all around the world when you, when you work on opera. This is how it's done. And the Chinese would be like, well, can't you answer this question? Mm -hmm. And I'd be saying, please answer the question. No, we're not going to answer the question because this is the way it's done everywhere in the world. And so it, there were the cultural right. misunderstandings. There was the internal politics. Uh, the composer and I are still trying to get it up as a Chinese production. So it collapsed? It collapsed as a co-production. We had two excerpts performed at the National Centre for the Performing Arts in China, which is wonderful as part of an Australian Highlights Year of Australian Culture uh, concert, and it was really well received at that. Um, and then we did a, a short um, version, and I was working with top-level people in the Pe National Peking Opera Company at the Shanghai Expo in the Australian Pavilion at an ANU event. We did a, a special show, um, and that was, and again, people were like, oh, you know, we want to see this whole thing. It did collapse as a co-production, but the composer is just determined to get it through as a Chinese production. So it's tantalisingly close in a way. I well, it keeps, <laughs> keeps receding, <laughs> in, in coming close and receding. It must have been and frustrating beyond measure for you. Oh, it was unbelievable. There were tears. There were tears. There was there were there was a bit of yelling. Um, <laughs> there was, but it, a bit there, of bad behaviour. But very interesting. It, if I can just yeah, um, sure. When the whole thing was collapsing. Uh, on the ground, on with, within the National Peking Opera Company, um, there was a meeting, and I knew at this point what the meeting was going to be about. And I had to rush back from Sydney to attend this meeting. Uh, Qantas lost my luggage. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I hadn't brushed my teeth. It was it was horrible. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I came in and um, I had thought about what I was going to do, and I was very careful, and I was very polite, and I worked on Chinese terms. I always speak in Chinese with the National Peking Opera Company people. And it went fine, and the two people who were my, the enemies of the project, um, were completely bamboozled. One read this really long speech from a notebook, um, like this, and then he put down the notebook, and I saw that there were only two words on the page. <laughs> <laughs> and that was quite funny. But afterwards, um, the people in the Peking, and all the other people in the Peking Opera Company who are our friends were sitting there the whole time like this. They were just sitting there. I was the only Australian in the room. They're all sitting there like this. They didn't even want to know what was going on. Yeah. And afterwards, they said to me, you did that so well. They said, we've never worked with a foreigner before. We didn't know whether you were going to yell, scream, threaten to sue. We didn't know what you were going to do. Um, and you handled it so beautifully, you got everyone's respect. And I thought, well, you know, there are things I think you That's build. That's the plus. That's yeah, the, yeah, you sort yeah, of it <laughs> does. It sounds like a very uh, reasonable, have and maybe it's not over. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that, that's a terrific story, Linda. Now, Wesley Enoch, I'm delighted to say, is uh, with us, and of course, you all know him very well. He's uh, uh, the artistic director of the Queensland Theatre Company. He's a Nunakul Nugi man, is that correct? Nugi. Nugi, pardon me. The first Indigenous Australian to head a state theatre company, and he comes to it with considerable experience. He's worked with many of Australia's leading companies. He's a prolific playwright himself, and uh, he's a member of various industry boards, as all Indigenous people are. They sit on copious boards. I do not know how you have a life, quite honestly. That's the story of, of activist uh, Indigenous people. So congratulations. And I wonder how you see this, Wesley. It's interesting. I've done uh, seven productions in Japan in, in my life, and it was interesting. I, I, I struck up a relationship with a, a, a theatre director there, and he said, what was fantastic is the stories of Indigenous Australia, the plays that we make, are fantastic tools to talk about Japan's colonial heritage and the relationship with the Koreans. And so he will take plays, Australian Indigenous plays, translate them into Japanese and perform them for Japanese audiences. And I've been there and I've directed a couple of them myself and all those things. And like when you do a show like Stolen, which was about stolen generations, you go, how will that ever be mm. uh, seen as important or in, in that Japanese experience? And it's amazing, like I didn't understand the conversation, but there were such heated discussions 
around this material and not from what has it meant in Australia and what that story means for us, but how a Japanese writer could not write that story. Why? And the sense of the shame, the shame cultures and the guilt cultures, you know, how one could argue that the dominant culture in Australia is a guilt culture, but the shame in, in Japan meant that they will never tackle that issue and that part of the relationship with Australia was helping them deal with their history and past. Mm. And it's fascinating. And then... Um, the, I was, you know, you eat chop with chopsticks, we all know how to use chopsticks kind of thing. And then there would come a moment and they would say, oh, how wonderful that you know how to use chopsticks. And I went, oh, isn't that great? A little bit of a, you know, pat on the back. And then someone said afterwards to me, they, they tell you a compliment at the moment that you've made a faux pas. <laughs> <laughs> I see. And so the mixed signals are huge. Here I am making a huge faux pas with chopsticks, but they're saying, ah, isn't it good? I haven't noticed how bad you are at it until now. <laughs> and, and so these kind of cultural differences are huge. So I had a stand-up argument with a designer. There was this one particular scene, the gentleman's meant to arrive in Kelvin Klein underwear as part of the scene, and she would say, oh, yes, I will get that and that would not arrive. And then I'd say, where's that underwear? He should really try it on, shouldn't he? And she would go, oh yes, of course, it'll come. And it just wouldn't arrive. And, and so in the end, I was going, what is your problem, bitch? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is going on here? And she was saying, as a Japanese woman, I will not know where to look at the moment he arrives on stage. And I was going, well, that's, kind of the effect I want. Right. That's an uncertainty and un, un, uh, an unnerving. And that particular designer was saying, well, that's unusual for us. And so the cultural differences aren't just language-based. Mm. There's a whole range of things. And as a creative artist, sometimes we want to revel in the uncomfortable. We want to go and talk about stories that will push us beyond our limits. And that sometimes these cultures... Uh, and of course, I'm speaking incredibly broadly here, but individuals in these cultures go, this is how we do things, and, we do, and especially in Japan, we do not want to be corrupted in so that. So it becomes a form of gatekeeping, really, I suppose. Oh, uh, and incredibly passive-aggressive behaviours to do it. And, and, you know, where we might say, let's approach an issue, let's talk about an issue, let's get through the argument of it, that, uh, that uh, the, what I learnt in Japan is that sometimes you have to go around the issue. And I was going, ah, oh, that's an Aboriginal experience. I have to go talk to the auntie of this group, right. not to the person who's in front of me. I have to go talk to someone who will help them through and give them the language. And so this kind of cultural mateship, I reckon, is about saying, we don't have to change necessarily who we are because we want some economic benefit from this relationship. We have to bring what we have mm. to the table mm. and say, yeah, we're going to have a bit of a Barney about this, but that's all right. Mm. And that we have some <coughs> unique offerings from an indigenous perspective to go, here's a cultural perspective which might be more aligned to yours. And how do we look at that indigenous cultural perspective and storytelling to help that relationship build? What happened with the Calvin Klein underwear? <laughs> it, it was fascinating <laughs> because once I talked to the auntie of the group, she convinced the designer that was okay and that the designer then gave permission for the male actor to go buy, buy the underwear and then when he walked out on stage, she would literally look away. <laughs> Gorgeous story. <laughs> and then come back, you know, and that having gone through all of that, at least she understood the process, that it wasn't about me bending to the will of another culture, but mm -hmm. us trying to negotiate. And I think that's a metaphor, if you like, about what I think the Asian century could be. Mm. Oh, terrific that's story. Right. And, uh, Dr. Julianne Schultz is uh, our final contributor. She's founding editor of the Griffith Review, a very respected agenda-setting quarterly journal, which many of you may know, currently chair of the Australian Film, TV and Radio School and of the Queensland Design Council, and she sat on the reference group of, uh, for the development of the National Cultural Policy, which was announced just last month. She's an ABC board member and recently named number eight <laughs> in Australia's power index for culturally influential people, and she notes she was 47 in the entire 50, so we think this is an extraordinary d achievement. <laughs> so, <laughs> Julianne, how would you answer that question of cultural mateship? I'm overwhelmed by the absurdity of the power <laughs> index from the first. Look, my, my take on this is to turn it around the other way a bit, um, and that is to say that to be a mate, you need to know yourself. And my sense, in a way, with a lot of the discussion that we've 
been having, and I think Wesley's picked this up very nicely, is that we need to know more about ourselves if we're going to be mates and have that sort of engagement. And I think one of my strong senses of the Henry report was that it was so much about trade and exchange and tapping into this new market, but was less about who we are and how we might engage, drawing on the, on the strengths and diversity of what we've got here. And in some ways, I thought that that was captured by the image on the cover. I mean, for those of you who've seen the print version of the, of the, of the uh, report rather than the, um, rather than the online one, because parents at Ivanhoe Grammar, where there was a photo of kids in school uniform, were rather astonished that the girl on the front cover is actually from North Africa. Now, it was sort of, in a way, from, from my point of view, sort of symbolised how we actually don't know what we've got here, and so we can actually confuse somebody who looks a bit brown as having come from somewhere other than here, <laughs> which is sort of goes to part of this, the, the sort of willful, I don't know, it's sort of like... Um, the diversity of this country is extraordinary. You know, we have 30% of the population born overseas. That's much, much higher than, you know, any, you know, many comparable countries. The United States, it's about 19%. Britain, under 10%. Canada, about 19%. So we're a, we're a country which has got an enormous population from, from much of it, many of them from this region. And yet, when we try to engage with it, we don't recognise both the strength that we've got here and how we can tap into that more effectively, but also the long history of engagement with Asia. Um, you know, when the, you know, the indigenous people dealing with the Macassans, you know, over centuries, um, the, um, uh, when Matthew Flinders, the circumnavigator of Australia, he thought that Darwin would be a more sensible place to have as the, as the nation's capital because it was closer to the trade that, that could be done. The whole push during the 19th century for an Australasian sort of um, um, sent, you, know, peer, you know, notion of association rather than the white Australia policy that comes in afterwards and, and becomes dominant for such a long time. So I think it's about knowing ourselves and our own history and then drawing on that culture in a way that makes it possible for us to, to engage. And my, I guess my concern when I think about the sort of the diversity that's here and how we don't factor that in in a really active way by looking at the, at the capacity that we've got um, means that what we project is something which is a shadow of what we once were, you know, so that there's a sort of a, ref, a, a recognition in the region, you know, for all the excitement that attaches to things that, like Wesley's described, you know, that somehow there's this residual notion of the sort of white Australia that sits as this sort of lump at the bottom of the, you know, the Pacific Ocean, rather than this very much more engaged engaged country. And that's because we're not doing the engagement ourselves. We're not telling these new stories to anywhere near, near the degree that we, that we need to be to be actually able to communicate actively. So when the Prime Minister goes to Western Sydney and talks about foreigners, I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of at odds with the reality. I mean, I was on the train to Western Sydney recently. I was the one who felt foreign. You know, mm. <laughs> there weren't many tall blonde women on that train. And so my sense is that if we're going to do this creative makeshift, we've actually got to know ourselves better and we've got to be able to create here something which makes the culture of what we've got attractive. So it's not just taking shows and, and parading what we've got, but actually building something here which draws on the resources of what we've got to actually be an attractor. You know, we are an attractor already because that 30% born overseas means that people want to come here, but giving something much richer in that, in that sense. And so I think we're a bit fearful of building a diverse culture and an open expression of that diverse culture in, in this society um, in a way that will make us a more meaningful mate for, for countries in the region. The, the thing I keep coming back to in my sort of thinking about the place of culture in all of this is that when you look at, at what are sort of successful societies, they, they tend to pay attention, you know, the, the four key components are the nature of the land, you know, what the resources are that are physically there, the nature of the people, the diversity, how well educated, what their capacity are, the resilience of their institutions, and we spend an enormous amount of time thinking about our institutions, and the strength of its culture. The culture is what holds it together and makes it possible to engage in all sorts of different ways. And we tend to let that slip. And I think that to, to have a really active engagement, we need to know who we are and how we want to do it in a really forward-looking way. OK, that's great. Now, that's, um, I think that's a fabulous sort of platform for us to continue our discussion. And I must um, point out that some of you are already very much hitting the uh, hashtag uh, GOMA Talks, or the, you can text us 
on 04 888 talks and I'll refer to uh, various texts and some very nice ones that have already come up. And I might even just take a couple of these before um, we open the floor to you. Um, so if we, does, the question here is, when was Australia ever white? I mean, in a sense, that depends, I suppose, <laughs> who, who's, on, who's on the soapbox and who's claiming it. Is that an issue, Michael? I mean, I must say, I, would, I hope that Julianne is wrong, that that sits there as a sort of lump of lard in terms of perceptions of the region towards us. Is, is it still? Because surely we have left that behind. I think it depends on <coughs> where you go in Asia. I mean, I've, I've had um, uh, very well-educated Indians assure me that Australia still has a, d a discriminatory immigration policy. Um, so, whereas, you know, in other, in other parts of, uh, of Asia, China probably not so much. Um, <coughs> but I do think it, it very much uh, depends on the eye of the beholder as the texter. Mm. Just, um, mm. is that a texter, texty? Te yeah, yeah, yes. Um, uh, texterissimus. <laughs> um, uh, I, I do think that, that the countries and the societies that tend to lambast us with this sort of thing also have a bit of a chip on their shoulder about these sorts of things. So Indians, Malaysians, um, the odd Singaporean, um, they tend to be the ones that, that have a go at, it, at us for this and they tend to be the ones that want to push us away. Mm. Uh, whereas the, the countries that tend, ironically tend to be more co comfortable with us are those that are, you know, very realistic about about what uh, about what we are and 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 how we do things. Linda, um, Steve Fitzgerald, <coughs> who was our first ambassador uh, and who went with Gough Whitlam on that historic trip in 1972 to China, to China. Professor uh, Steve Fitzgerald recently wrote a very interesting essay on the 40 years of relationship between China and um, Australia, and he made a really interesting point, which I thought related um, quite well to uh, what you were saying just now about identity and knowing yourself, and that is he talked about how we have had this discussion with, uh, with many prime ministers, leading Keating is one, obviously, Gough Whitlam and so on, um, but that John Howard put the whole thing on identity to sleep. Like, we're not going to talk about our relationship, our identity, identity politics suddenly became on the nose um, in general, and also the whole notion of um, where we sit in the Asian region. People have been discussing big ideas, and Steve makes the point, he says, that many times in our relationship with China, and he's talking about China specifically, I know that, um, we're talking about Asia generally, but he's, I think it probably applies, we've got it right, but he said this isn't a time when we've got it right, and it's because we don't think in big ideas. Um, whether it's Howard, um, even, um, and, and this government now, it doesn't matter, we've been thinking practically, we do business, we go and we come, but we don't conceptualize this thing, we don't define ourselves in a dialogue with Asia, with Asian countries. So this Asian century, Australia in the Asian century, uh, is that a step forward, that whole white paper? Well, it's, I, I mean, I think it's a bit arbitrary. The century turns and where yeah. everything changes, I don't think so. Everything's a bit, everything is obviously continuous. Categorizations like that are, are useful for politics and they're useful for journalists, uh, but they don't really mean an awful lot. Uh, probably the Asian century, as I think Steve Fitzgerald makes out, um, really began in, say, the 80s or the 90s, you know, uh, more properly. Um, well, yeah. actually, another question that's come in um, on uh, SMS, does, Australia, does Asia really want us to be cultural mates in the Asian century? I mean, what's your... Well, your, your uh, discussion from Japan is interesting, Wesley. I mean, what's your feeling about that? Look, I think, <clears throat> I think there's a point where we know that the future is... Um, the cooperation is necessary. You know, we've got things in this country that other countries want, and we have to value that as well, but it's not just instrumental, that the cultural kind of exchange is not an instrument of trade, but it's a sense of saying, how do we look at the intrinsic value in working together? And, you know, they're broad motherhood statements, but there's a point where we say our, our cultural expression can help other countries look at... So, so my feeling about China, and we talk about human rights violations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, let's use our storytelling and our cultural 
um, institutions to help shape stories in those places rather than just use our legal institutions to do it. You know, how do we talk about those but things? But it's also a question of listening as well. And, do, and, sure. and, and I think the balance of power is shifting in a lot of cultural spheres. Because I work a lot with film, um, what I've noticed is recently I was uh, working with uh, Wang Kar Wai on his latest film, The Grandmaster, and his sound designers were from Sydney. Um, I was working on a film in China, with a very small indie film, mm -hmm. and the person who was doing the music, scoring the music, was Gus McMillan from Blue Grassy Knoll. So, and they were being sought out and paid yep. by... I also yep. met a woman in Shanghai who's... Um, she's a, she, she's a, a contacts person with co-productions and so on. She said, now the Chinese film industry is looking to make itself, to make Chinese films better, more commercial, more viable, more interesting to Chinese people as well as, as, as gain a world audience. And she said, now we're, we're looking to hire Hollywood screenwriters. We want to hire Hollywood this and Hollywood that. And we want to hire the best people from around the world. Um, so the sh power balance is shifting on the one hand. They've got, mm. they are looking for this. And on the other, I think they do, we have to make ourselves available to be, I think Artlink did something very interesting when they produced that, that um, issue on uh, Aboriginal art that was completely translated into Chinese that they took to China in, at the time of a major exhibition of Aboriginal art. And that was a brilliant move. And that, of course, opens the whole dialogue. Well, look, I'm going to open the whole dialogue. Perfect uh, segue. Uh, and I think we've got... It's very hard for me to just see because it's very bright light, but we've got mics either side and um, Goma people are going to run around. If you wave at me, um, I will continue to take your uh, texts and your tweets. Love to, it's terrific to have uh, the capacity to hear these while we're on the way. But... Um, do wave at me if you or wave at the people so that they can see you and uh, um, I'd be very grateful for some questions. So are there any sort of particularly... I'll keep going. This what about... Oh, sorry, I can't... This one? There. Right, just... In the centre. In the centre. I can't see. <laughs> wave <laughs> just, a hand. Wave a hand. Oh, there you are. Yes, yes, please. If you wouldn't mind just handing that along. Thank you. I'll direct them from here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Several speakers so far have made reference to the need to know who we are as Australians and to tell our cultural stories in engaging with Asia. I was just wondering if the panel tonight thinks this is a good reason to re-engage people in the Republic debate. In the Republic debate? Julianne. Um. I'm, I'm all for all sorts of debates. <laughs> that's, that's probably one that's worth having. Um, but just to pick up, um, I mean, I think that, that those sorts of conversations about political um, uh, structure and so on obviously grow out of those sort of conversations and of, of, of who we are and who we're on the way to becoming. And, and so possibly that's one of the outcomes, although I wouldn't have started, started with that as the sort of headline issue. I think it's rather more about this sort of slow process of both reaching back into the depths of what we've got and then reaching out. And, and I think that people who are involved in the sort of creative sphere especially very much see themselves playing in a world stage, you know, so they want to come and go and be, be um, very, um, you know, able to, to learn and interact in, in both here and, and abroad. But I think that my, my concern, I guess, is that how we actually make sure that we're making the most of what we've got here because it, it's, it's the leg up. I mean, one of the um, things that strikes me is that, you know, if you've got this very large number of people coming here from India and China, um, and it, it's particularly, but but not only, but but how their engagement with the long history of Chinese and Indian settlement here, you know, it brings a richness to the story. I mean, I have a friend who's a who's came here after Tina Men, and he has made this sort of determined um, process of educating his children about Chinese engagement with Australia. And so he recently took them to, to uh, Sovereign Hill, to Ballarat, and said, I stood there weeping for the Chinese coolies, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there's this long history of sort of complicated engagement, which I think provides all sorts of different bridges than the ones that we think are there in, in an obvious way. Just what, yes, sorry, sorry, so Just a sense too that I think as, as people who work in cultural spheres, we are constantly making symbols and metaphors and all that stuff, and that the Republic is waiting for a big symbol, a big metaphor, and I think that's going to be the death of Elizabeth. When she dies, uh, and we feel that moment pass, 
is the moment that we will go, that's the symbol for our next evolution. Mm -hmm. And so until those kind of things happen, everything else brings out all the, the nutter debate, I think, as well, which is interesting. Uh, just while we're waiting um, <laughs> for... One of the... Th Alison Carroll, who's been a real contributor uh, to uh, cultural collaboration for many years, it, they've brought out... Artlink has brought out a very interesting uh, 20 years since the first Asia-Pacific uh, Triennial uh, Exhibition. And she says here, um, we live in an era of art history when the term contemporary Asian art mm. means only one thing, works by post Tiananmen Square Chinese artists that fetch millions of dollars on the auction block. Looking at the auction booms for Southeast Asian art since 2007, one could easily substitute Southeast Asia or Indonesia or Philippines for Chinese into the assertion. Now, what about this issue that I think I would like to name, actually, Linda, that there's this giant gulf developing inside Asia between the super wealthy, you know, real fabulous wealth, to use the phrase of the, of the yeah. week, <laughs> and not our superannuation, and, um, and, you know, Asians on the ground. And I don't know that Australians feel very comfortable with that at all. So, I mean, I wonder whether that, that, uh, that sort of extraordinary wealth that is developing, and that's where the collectors are coming from, I don't know whether Australians feel much easy simpatico with that at all. Well, I think there's a couple of there's a number of issues there. Um, one is the gap between rich and poor within China itself, um, and how that's you know that's reflected in the art world as well. We've got these art superstars, and then we've got um, the people who are working on building sites, you know, for mm. uh, 60 hours a, a week and so on. Um, but I think. Um, just to get back to one at the beginning point of that question, and that is I think we don't tend to look at the collaborations that go on within Asia because we're not interested, but they do go on. And I think that we often overlook that, but you'll have um, Chinese Indonesian or, or Chinese um, Filipino or Chinese... Collaborating. Yeah, collaborating. Um, uh, when I was... I've spent a lot of time in the Peking opera world lately, and um, there's been Chinese-Japanese collaborations because the Japanese love uh, Peking opera and Quinchu, they actually get it. Um, and so there's a much bigger audience there than there is any, in any other country um, for such a form. Um, and you often find this sort of thing going on, but we overlook it. We just think in bi binary terms, you know, Australia and, or the West and, mm. um, but within Asia, there's a very complex, don't you think, Michael? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, in some ways, there's a positive spin you can put on this that, um, you know, I, as someone who works on a university campus, you always know that the best cars on campus are, are the students' cars. You know, <laughs> you'd never find a, a, an academic driving a, a Ferrari or a BMW. Um, but I actually think it's, it's, there's, a, there's a good side to the, this, and that is that, um, you know, I remember when I was growing up, um, the term Asian was a pejorative one. And the pejorative sense of it was that they were, they were poor, uh, they were coming from teeming societies, and they were coming here to Australia to, uh, to take part in the good life. And therefore, they were kind of, you know, they were in some ways contaminating because they were, they were taking, you know, all of, the, all of the good life away from us. Just like uh, refugees. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I think one of the things that's changed with, uh, at least in, in the... In the time of my memory is that a, to be Asian has become much less of a pejorative term. We're, we seem to be worried about Muslims these days, but, you know, to be Asian mm -hmm. is uh, often to be, to be someone who speaks with an Australian accent, someone who's got a lot of money, someone who's going places, someone who's a doctor or a lawyer. Um, and I think, therefore, it kind of... The, the, the growth of the fabulously wealthy in Asia kind of is breaking down some of our very old stereotypes about crowded, poor, dirty countries and uh, may even facilitate um, us making that kind of emotional and intellectual leap. 
Geraldine, I, can I just say that I mean I think that, 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 that that's part of the strength of things like this Asia Pacific Triennial. You know that that you get a sense of the richness and the engagement and the really edgy stuff that's happening in countries all through the region. And one of the things in, in this year's Triennial that really struck me the other day is it was when I was looking at it again was the the Papua New Guinea stuff. You know, mm -hmm. in the on the entrance level of the of the foyer, because you know Australia. You know, Papua New Guinea was a colony. You know, it's a country that we've had a really deep engagement with. But we, you know, our level of engagement now is, you know, it's sort of, well, there's a bit of trade, there's, there's terrible rascals, there's violence, you know, there's, you know, Kokoda Trail, and that's about it, rather than this really quite rich and sort of nuanced um, um, relationship. And I think when you look at that exhibition in the, in the triennial, you go, oh, this is, something, this is something else. This is something, there's wit, there's humour, there's, you know, great craftsmanship. So I thought it was sort of really interesting seeing that and also in, then putting that in the context that of the, um, the Miles Frankton long list this year includes two books which are set in Papua New Guinea. So it mm. seems to me that that's sort of saying that the engagement is much more nuanced and much more complex. You know, there's 39 or so countries in Asia, you know, and if you take the Pacific, there's another, I don't know, another dozen or so. So that you actually have to have a much more nuanced way of thinking about how you, how you engage with them. Actually, um, somebody said uh, one of the texts we had was, why don't we talk about the Pacific mm -hmm. when we talk about uh, yeah. uh, Asia-Pacific? And we, we just, you've at least raised PNG, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really get a Guernsey. It, it keeps getting swamped, doesn't it? Like literally, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's interesting to see, like in Queensland, I say this all the time, there are half a million New Zealanders living in Queensland. Mm -hmm. And that anecdotally is economic and environmental refugees from the Pacific coming through New Zealand to settle in Queensland. And so you get this sense that there's this big shift happening, but we're not talking about it. There's no symbols, metaphors, stories that are going to help us prepare for that. Uh, because I think we, we don't see the economic benefit in that kind of relationship, where we look to Asia and see an economic benefit to sell coal, iron ore, meat, wheat, whatever, rice, but we don't see that in the, in the Pacific in the same way, and I think that's to our detriment in some respects. New Zealand's a lot more active in that, mm. in that environment, mm -hmm. I, think. I think. I think we take the Pacific for granted. I think mm. we just assume that it's always going to be there, it's always going to be beautiful, it's always going to be on our, our side. It's never going to be a threat. And it's never going to be a threat. Mm. And, and I, I'm, I'm not but sure But do we that's think it's never going to be creative? I mean, that's what we're trying no. to look at. Do, do, are we, is there going to be curiosity from he here uh, for, say, Peking Opera, like it's a very different <laughs> form, <laughs> very different yeah. form. I mean, that's well, what I mean about being honest about these things. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've, we've faced that because if we had gotten a, a, a production set here, if we had signed off on something here, it would have all gone forward in China um, anyway. But um, this also relates, whether it's the Pacific or anywhere else, somebody submitted a question about emerging artists in Asia and are the young more open to and welcoming of collaboration with Australia, which I think is a really interesting mm, question okay. because um, I think that the, the young all over the region and all over the world are open to collaboration because they think, because they are so globally connected um, that they think in terms that don't really... They're, they're not focused on nation when they're thinking of creativity. They're much more, you know, an artist in Indonesia might be looking to Damien Hirst before they're looking to an, another Indonesian artist. I mean, obviously, I, I think that we, we, the young and emerging artists are where the really interesting collaborations are going to take place, and not in things like Peking Opera. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe that is something that we could, I just could ask you all about where you think the average Australian, awful term I suppose, could start to even uh, enjoy the art that is contemporary art that is on display from the region. I mean... The APT? <laughs> I meant, yes, yes, of course, you'd start with the APT, I, but I was thinking about, uh, is, it, is there an easy uh, fit or not? Is it, is it really edgy that you've got to <laughs> force yourself to enjoy? Well, I think yeah. Korean film is a good place to start. Korean film is, I think, the best film in the world at the moment. The most really? dynamic, the most creative, uh, the most interesting. Um, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, when, when you suggest it to someone, and, I mean, you know, the, it's not to everyone's taste. It can be very violent at times, but there's a huge variety in Korean film. Um, suddenly people really like it. And the thing that they, they do is that they, it suddenly forces them to realise how self-referential a lot of Hollywood film has become. Mm. Mm. 
And the fact that Kore Koreans are doing this sort of stuff and they're borrowing from everywhere. Um, uh, you know, one of my favourites is a film called The Good, The Bad and The Weird, which is a, uh, r a, 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 a riff on, um, you know, the, the old Sergio Leone classic. Mm, mm. But it's set in 1940s uh, Manchuria. And it's just a fantastic film. And, uh, and it's, it's so vibrant. And you just realise that, that by you know, by, by just changing the lens and having a look at what a different film culture is doing with well, film. China's doing that. It's China's incredibly looking exciting. at Korea. China, mm. China, China, China is mad about Korean soap operas, mm. mad about Korean actors, um, music. several music, everything. There's yep. several. So um, far beyond Gangnam sort of mm. thing. It's oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, way, yeah, yeah. way yeah. beyond that. Um, even though Ai Weiwei did a Gangnam <laughs> style, yeah, I saw that. which was very funny. I saw that. Um, but yeah, the, if you, if you, the major Chinese films recently have all featured Korean actors. Yep. Mm. yep. Um, it's mm. it's interregional mm. collaboration. Okay. Have you, you, you got any offerings? No, you haven't. Actually, there, w there is one thing about Japan, because one of the fascinating little um, bits in this uh, art link book, Wesley, is that uh, Japanese curators are being asked to go all over the world mm. to, cur to cur curate exhibitions and so on, but there's not one single instance of a non-Japanese person being invited to curate uh, any major exhibition of any nature in Japan. Really? Mm, that's interesting. Now, is that... Is that like, in other words, again, if we're going to talk about things that we don't wish to say, is there a sort of a jingoism or a fear, getting back to your lady who didn't want to see the man in the Calvin Klein underwear, um, is that still a, a real issue in Japan? Well, in Japan, you have to go back to when they did close themselves off and they chose to open up at a very particular moment. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's a, um, uh, to, to, to a convenience store is convenience store. And that word had to be made into Japanese. So there's a way of translating an experience into Japanese as well, not just in the language, but in the uh, everything. So someone is there as the gatekeeper to make sure everything is still Japanese. And I find that fascinating. But that's, you know, anathema in this country where we, we think, well, let's find out what someone else is thinking and let's find out. Mm. But I don't know, it's the but same it, And it was the Japanese, by doing that to the West, that facilitated the Chinese being mm. able to import Western ideas yeah. and... And, 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 and so Japan acted as a doorway, if you like. Mm -hmm. Chinese, um, uh, many Chinese studied in Japan mm. in the early 20th century, and it was a huge influence on everything from the notion of contemporary policing to, um, to art and, and theatre. But how often do we know even the history of, of uh, Western colonisation in, in Asia? I, I, Absolutely. I remember someone That's saying to me, right. can you draw the Chinese peninsula? And you go, oh, it's kind of like round... And you went, no, I, d I can't. And there's a sense where we don't even know the geography for us to even right. to draw it. And so it's a in wonderful thing when you're saying, what does the average Australian do? You actually have to just get basic knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but it's also about Australia's role in the, in, in, in the post-war, in the decolonisation process. Mm. You know, that Australia played a very active role in the decolonisation of a lot of, a lot of countries. I mean, it was Australia was the, uh, the advocate for, for Indonesia in the, in the United was. Nations. You know, so that's where we started our whole peacekeeping. It that's was in really Indonesia. So that whole totally sort noble. of thing of, of an active involvement in the region, um, you know, broadly defined, in a positive way rather than in a defensive way is actually there's, there's a richness there that we've got to draw on mm. that, we, that we've, we tend to overlook. Somebody's tweeted to us, are we overrating Australia's importance in Asia? Are we even relevant in a cultural and economic sense there compared with the US? Well, I've just got a, a little anecdote. Um, just the other day I noticed that um, Beijing has uh, started an international screenwriting competition and they're going to pay uh, quite a lot of money to winning screenplays and fly people in and um, give them meetings and all that. And then the, it, it's only for people who are in the United States. Oh, that's depressing. So if you're an Australian... Get on to that, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, there's this kind... Yeah, I mean, we do tend to overrate it. We're here, we think about Australia, but in many cases, they're thinking about the US. It's absolutely true. What's, that? What, what's the unique offering, though, yeah, I think? Yeah, yeah. You know, yes, like, yeah. So, so you, you want to see Shakespeare, you're going to get the Royal Shakespeare Company, too. Yes. That's, that's the Asian... And if you want mentality. Hollywood, you get Hollywood. You get Hollywood. Yeah, so. But, I, I yeah. think but Bangara would surely be a fabulous... Well, and that's what I'm saying. Well, I was Bangara kind of Dance Theatre. Singgrang, singgrang to that, the idea that <laughs> <coughs> the indigenous kind of cultural perspective is the unique offering yeah, yeah, yeah. that so. you can't actually get from anywhere else. Not just use it as a calling card, but as a kind of cultural bridge. But there's another there's another aspect here, um, and that is mm -hmm. that 
I've, I've been teaching um, the, the politics and international relations of Asia for nearly 20 years at Australian universities, and I'm constantly fascinated that, you know, over half the class are always from Asian countries. And, I, I, you know, I, I was always curious. And at one stage, I, I actually asked some students from Asian countries, and they said, well, the sorts of conversations we have about my own country in your classroom, we couldn't have at home. Yeah. And we couldn't have them in the, in the United States mm. because the US sees everything from a US yeah. view of the world. Mm. Mm. And we couldn't have them in Europe because they're not interested in Asian countries. Mm. So they, they were actually coming Opting and having for. those conversations yep. about their own cultures and their own countries yeah, yeah. in an Australian classroom. That's and I think that's a unique yeah, yeah. niche yeah. that we have. And we don't mm. make enough of that. I just wonder whether... Um, the, a real populist break... What, what might be a popular art form that could break through, though, um, from Asia to us and us to Asia? Uh, is there some... You know, have you seen in your... Because obviously, you know, some of the cont contemporary art is very challenging for a lot of Australian audiences, and in terms of a broad, general mass take-up, it, it, it's got to move slowly. I'm just wondering whether there are sort of big breakthrough forms that you can see coming? What, the Taiwanese animations? Well, I suppose that is, I suppose that is the sort of thing. Mm. Um, mm. Japanese anime did it mm. yep. years ago. Yeah. What's the modern... You know, Indonesia's got um, incredible music culture, actually. I'm not talking about gamla, I'm talking about the modern, very modern mm. music culture, which I've always felt had a real... was a real potential mm. to develop that if somebody had the nous to do that here. But one of the problems with China in particular is that um, Chinese exceptionalism, this whole <laughs> notion that China is, it lives in a different sphere, and it actually limits some of the ways that they approach their own culture. Um, the visual arts are frequently made for a foreign audience, so they speak directly to us um, because foreigners were the first to be able to buy the art, so they were... Uh, they. Um, unduly influenced the kind of art that was made in China, very political, that certain things got favored. But um, what happens is um, you don't have, you have Chinese writing novels that are so specific to the Chinese situation, they almost, right. you have that kind of problem. See, I've always, one of the things I suggested at that 2020 summit that we were talking about earlier, Julianne and Wesley and I, is that we think about, somebody think about a staging almost like an Archibald Prize that went region-wide. So that it was about portraiture, it was about faces, it was about people that we learned, uh, that, and, and with a decent prize, uh, even though I know portraiture doesn't really have a great history in, um, in a lot of Asian cultures. But that's the sort of thing I mean, it really a sort of breakthrough moment. Can you see that happening? I, I, I mean, I wonder whether, you know, the, the level, if you can say the, at the level of high culture that, that there re really is mutual awareness and mutual understanding, it's at the level of popular culture that it's mm. just not mm. happening. No, I yeah. know. And, and until that happens, I think the vast mass of, of Australians are going to still remain very much focused on Europe, very much focused on America, and uh, you, you'll get the odd... I mean, if you had, you know, if Mr Gang Gangnam style could follow up... Quite. Um, you know, then you might start to see some real change and some real breakthroughs at all levels, I think. But, now, Australi but Australians travel to Asia a lot, and they, when they travel, they don't just drink and go to beaches. I mean, they, they, they soak up... But they go and see ancient sites like Angkor Wat, you know, and things yeah, that were sort but of they go and see six centuries ago. That's part of, you know, that's, that's good. I mean, I don't think that's a bad thing. I no, mean, it's not a bad yeah, thing, but it's yeah. not now, is it? It's not uh, necessarily yeah. advancing. I mean, I do think that the, the Asia-Pacific Triennial here has been enormously important in terms of, you know, making, making contemporary art accessible. Um, and, you know, you see that sort of White Rabbit Gallery in Sydney, you know, which, which is like one of the coolest places you can go if you're a young Sydney cider. You know, you get in there and, you know, there are crushes and crowds of people. So I think these things happen at all sorts of levels. I mean, it's such a diverse, you know, such a diverse area. And, and people's forms of engagement are so open-ended now, you know, whether it's digitally or, or in real, you know, tangible objects. I, I, should, I should know the answer to this, but I don't. Is Neighbours a hit anywhere in Asia? <laughs> I don't think so, by the look of the, <laughs> <laughs> the 
that you, I just suddenly thought, you know, if you think of, of, of what we export, I mean, it certainly works elsewhere. What was, the, what, was it Return to Eden? Or Return to Eden. It, that was Return huge Return to Eden was a big hit. Yeah. 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 Yes. So. Water rats was big at one point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we'll leave that just... It wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> now, final question that I, I often do when... Oh, yes, OK, we'll ask... Can, you, can we have a mic right down the front here? And then we'll, I'll ask them all to sum up. Yes, please. Thank you for the, can you hear me? Yep. Thank you for the talk. Uh, appreciate everything you guys have said. But I'm wondering, I recently saw Battle Royale. I don't, Battle Royale. Right. It's a Japanese film. And its storyline is pretty much the same as um, the book The Hunger Games. Right. But apparently the author said she's never heard of this. But there's a small community in Adelaide that follows this movie. Um, it's a Japanese movie. And... I don't know if you've seen it, you've never seen it, I guess. But it's exactly the same, and it was done before The Hunger Games oh. came out. So, so how did you find out about it? I came to this. <laughs> oh. I came to see it here, and um, I was shocked because I read The Hunger Games. I read book one, book two, book three. And when I saw this, I said, wow, like, this is a total rip-off. Um, you know, she's actually taking their story. Um, and if you see it and you read The Hunger Games, it's pretty much identical. Right. Well, I so, no, yeah. I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> Anybody seen? No. Yeah. That's not this. But no. Okay. okay. Well, look. Thank you very much. That's. Um, I mean, presumably there are all sorts of little anecdotes like that of people tapping in, and maybe that is the great hope that people will go in in their own way. But I, I want to ask everybody: if you had one lever of power to pull to change things, if you were sitting in a super powerful position, some of you maybe already, what would it be? So I, want you to, I don't want you to just restate the problem. I'm interested in what, what you do, which is really about policy, I suppose. What would you do if you had your chance, Michael? Um, education. I think um, one of the, really th the things that we get consistently wrong in this country is that we don't teach our kids at school the fascinating history of, of our region. Um, uh, I was never taught about Indonesia at school and I've got two boys at school at the moment and I don't think they're going to be taught about Indonesia at all. And yet the countries of, uh, to the north of us have got absolutely fascinating histories. And how can we expect them to be curious about the languages and you know, the cultures and everything else, uh, anything else but you know, the beaches, if we don't teach them anything about it? So if I wanted to change one thing to, tomorrow, I would say, uh, you have to have, you know, the, the passionate teaching of the fascinating histories of our region um, to our kids. I think that's part of the plans in the, the, w w that's been announced today in terms of trying to advance the next stage of the Asian century. The curriculum, I think, is, is a significant part, but it remains to be seen whether it happens. Linda? I would detach uh, what I consider to be the pernicious culture of free market fundamentalism from culture education um, and issues like climate change and so on, environmental management. I think if we do that, we can actually develop in a really genuinely creative way. Uh, we can look at education. Students are not clients, they're students. You know, we, 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 yeah, need, yeah. <laughs> we really need to value culture for itself, detach all of that. But does that mean subsidise it? If it doesn't pay its way, does it not matter? It doesn't matter. All, okay. you look at Europe, they value their culture, they subsidize it, they know it's important in and of itself. Um, you know, you, you, to, to what extent you subsidize it is another matter, but we have to stop thinking in terms of economic rationalism and that will also have an impact on the way that we deal with the nations around us in the region because we will be able to get that long vision that Steve Fitzgerald was talking about and wake up from this uh, this, this long sleep. Okay, <laughs> Wesley? Um, <clears throat> I believe in the plastic brain, the idea that, you know, <clears throat> you, your, your, the, your practice of your brain shifts the way you think, and this is a bit of social engineering, the, the idea that promotion in the public service is connected to the number of languages you have. Not just Asian <laughs> languages, but languages, yes. because if you understand two or three different languages, you sh your brain is shaped around a different perspective and understanding, and that helps in just the communication. 
Julianne. And my prescription would be, um, in a policy sense, that just as we have environmental impact statements and we have impact statements measuring all sorts of different components when there are major government policies announced, that, um, that cultural impact statements should be built into it as well, which would require thinking much more creatively about how the culture is defined, how you measure its outcomes, how you measure um, and evaluate what what, what you're hoping to have achieve by, some, by whatever the policy might be, but you say the cultural impact of this is something which we need to take seriously in the design of whatever the policy might be and build that in at, you know, at that point. Good lofty thoughts and I want to thank you all very much indeed and uh, I'm sorry that we couldn't get to more of your questions, but would you please thank Dr Julianne Schultz, Dr Michael Wesley, Linda Javen and Wesley Enoch for... Uh, <laughs> So I hope you've enjoyed uh, listening tonight to whether you, we, we, I don't know whether we fully answered the question, is creative mateship possible? But I think we have heard some truth telling. It will be on Radio National Saturday Extra this coming Saturday. We'll do about 20 minutes on, on my show and then the full uh, program will be on Big Ideas a little bit later. I don't know the exact date. So keep an ear out for uh, Radio National's coverage of uh, these GOMA talks which have been very successful. So thank you very much indeed for coming on. Uh, along and I do hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to meeting several of you too. So thank you very much indeed.